SpaceX have just entered uncharted engine territory, there's more hope for Virgin Orbit, Strato Launch have finally done what they were created to do and much more is to come in this Tomorrow Space News. We're kicking off this edition down in Florida, but probably not where you'd expect, as we're talking about trains. The Miami to West Palm Beach private railway Brightline has become the first passenger rail service in the world to introduce onboard connectivity with Starlink. Starlink is available throughout Brightline's entire fleet, with it expanding to the new Orlando route when it opens in the summer. And the best part? It's on the house for all passengers. With this addition, it means that Starlink has broken into all the popular modes of transport people use in their everyday lives. Rail, aviation, maritime and even on the road. I suppose the only issue they're yet to conquer is tunnels. Elon's took to Twitter again this week, but it's for a good reason as SpaceX has managed to achieve a chamber pressure of 350 bar with a prototype Raptor engine. For some comparison with some engines you may be familiar with, the RD-180 used on the Atlas V reached 262 bar, the RS-25 used on the Space Shuttle and now SLS reached 206 bar, and the Merlin 1D used on the Falcon family reached 108 bar. This number is a world first. According to Elon, SpaceX didn't expect the engine to survive the full duration test and that it's uncharted territory. Heading down to Starbase at the launch site, the repairs being made to and around the mount are continuing as work progresses towards the installation of the new water deluge system. In this shot, you can see rebar being lowered into a hole before it was filled with concrete. It seems as if the SpaceX team want to be launching again as soon as possible, and the quicker they can repair the launch site, the better. At the current rate, even one or two more Starship flights this year could tip the company's total launches to that magical number, 100. Strato Launch, the operator of the world's widest plane, the scaled composites model 351 Strato Launch, better known as ROC, has successfully completed a separation release test of the Talon A separation test vehicle TA0. Talon A is eventually going to be a hypersonic testbed vehicle, allowing customers to test their payloads at Mark 5 to Mark 7. It's the latest in a variety of vehicles that could have flown under the wing of ROC, and unlike the others that have come before it, it looks as if Talon A has a bright future ahead. The drop test flight of TA-0 departed runway 30 at the Mojave Air and Spaceport at approximately 1600 UTC on Saturday before heading out west over Vandenberg and into the Pacific. Rock flew one and a half circuits at 21,000 feet before dropping TA-0 and returning to Mojave. As we've become accustomed to at this point, the four hours and eight minutes flight concluded with a few circuits of the aerodrome before touching down back on runway 30. Alongside the separation of TA-0 from ROC, this test flight also confirmed that telemetry can be received by ground assets at Vandenberg Space Force Base, giving Strato launch more redundancy when they begin hypersonic flights. Speaking of hypersonic flights, the current timeline has the first test flight booked in for late summer. If all goes to plan, this flight will see the next Talon A vehicle, TA-1, separate from the wing of ROC and accelerate up to Mark 5 under the power of a single Hadley Kerolox engine from Ursa Major. United Launch Alliance's Vulcan appears to be back on the testing track as the vehicle slated to perform the maiden flight of the type has been rolled out once again to Space Launch Complex 41 in Florida. The rollout was for a fairingless wet dress rehearsal on Saturday. Both the first stage and the Centaur 5 second stage were filled up to the brim with their cryogenic methalox and hydrolox fields respectively, simulating all launch day preparations halting just before the ignition of the two BE-4 engines on the first stage. According to CEO Tori Bruno, ULA headed into the terminal count and came out the other side successfully, securing the vehicle and detanking all of the propellant and oxidizer on board. At the time of writing, that's all we've gotten out of Tori and the team over at ULA, but from what we have heard, it appears that the wet dress went according to plan. Keep an eye out on ULA socials over the next few days, as there's a good chance we could be seeing the so-called flight readiness firing of Vulcan. It'll be a static fire of the two BE-4 engines on the first stage, verifying that they're healthy and ready for flight. That won't be the end of the journey for the first Vulcan though, because it still needs its payload and the fairing. This will require a rollback to the vertical integration facility at Slick 41, where Astrobotics Peregrine Lunar Lander and the first two Kuiper Constellation internet satellites will be fitted. Celestis will also have their Enterprise flight mission on board, carrying the cremated remains of approximately 150 people. 
Virgin Orbit's bankruptcy timelines have been slightly modified this week to allow more time for bidders to express their interest in the company or its assets. The deadline for final bids has been pushed by a working week from the 15th, the day of this episode's release, to the 19th, which is this coming Friday. Because of this shift in bids, the bidders will also be notified if their bids qualify at a later date on May 21st. If there is more than one bid that has been qualified by this date, then a bankruptcy auction will take place. Virgin Orbit have not given a reason for this extension. In a statement published last week, Virgin Orbit confirmed that the company had received over 30 indications of interest for asset purchasing, including, quote, multiple parties that proposed to continue to operate the business as a going concern and retain current employees in an integrated enterprise. It still remains uncertain as to whether or not the company will be bought out in its entirety or if its assets will be purchased individually. Ars Technica's Eric Berger seems to believe that Virgin Orbit will survive this Chapter 11 bankruptcy, however we should proceed with caution when getting our hopes up with the future of the company. OHB is a German aerospace company that is a key tanks and structures supplier for Ariane 6, Ariane Space's next generation heavy lift launch vehicle. Unfortunately, according to their predictions, the newest member of the Ariane family won't be launching this year. The CEO of OHB has said that he's getting more and more optimistic that Ariane 6 will launch early next year by the day, which I'm sure all fans of European spaceflight will be very happy to hear. No precise estimation of the first launch date has been announced by anybody just yet, but we shouldn't be more than a year away. Ariane Space, ESA and any of the other contractors are yet to comment on a launch date slip for Ariane 6. The last information we heard out of Ariane Space and ESA was over six months ago, when the vehicle was still on track for a Q4 2023 launch. In April, however, ESA Director General Joseph Ashbacher did say that once the hot fire test of the first Ariane 6 is completed, a more accurate time frame can be calculated. As of a month ago, that was expected in July. China's been resupplying cargo, but first, I want to give a big thank you to all of the citizens of tomorrow. Even though we're losing Station 204 at the end of the year, your support and generosity is greatly appreciated, which is why in return you get access to our post-show hangouts where we talk about anything and everything, space news scripts as they're being written, and much more. For more information on how you can join the Ground Support Suborbital, Orbital, Escape Velocity, and Cloud Pro Plus citizens, head to the join button below. We're kicking off the week down on Henan Island in China as at 13.22 Coordinated Universal Time on Wednesday, this Long March 7 launched the Tianzhou 6 cargo resupply mission towards the Tiangong Space Station from Launch Complex 201 at the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center. Sneaking between the launch and docking, wow, I'm so surprised, it's a Starlink mission. Sarcasm aside, Starlink Group 2 Mission 9 departed Space Launch Complex 4 East at the Vandenberg Space Force Base at 2009 UTC, lofting 51 more Starlinks up into orbit. This launch marked SpaceX's 30th Falcon launch this year, keeping them on track for a new world record. The boost supporting this flight, B1075, successfully touched down on Of Course I Still Love You. Heading back up to LEO, Tianzhou 6 docked to the aft port on the station's Tiana core module just a few hours later at 2116 UTC. Following the hatch opening, Fei Zhulong, Deng Qingming and Zhang Lu all had access to the 13 tons of cargo stored on board. Tianzhou 6 currently plans to depart the station and burn up in the Earth's atmosphere in January. You guessed it, it's another Starlink launch. This time, however, it was from Slick 40. It departed SpaceX's first East Coast pad at 0503 UTC on Sunday the 14th, carrying 56 V1.5 satellites to SpaceX's second generation of the Constellation. The Falcon 9 booster supporting this flight was B1067, which unlike the Starlink flight earlier in the week, is nearly one of the fleet leaders. It concluded its 11th flight on the drone ship, just read the instructions, and marked the Falcon 9's 200th consecutive successful orbital flight. Coming up on Wednesday, Beidou 3 G4 will be launching on the Long March 3BE. We have a Friday doubleheader on the calendar with Starlink 63 from Florida and the Iridium 9 and OneWeb 19 rideshare from Vandenberg. Axiom 2 to the ISS is on track for Sunday, the first ever RTLS recovery for a crewed mission, and we have Arabsat 7B early on Monday morning on, you guessed it, yet another Falcon 9. You know the drill by now, Dr. Tamitha Scove will be back on Wednesday with an update on the latest on those solar storms she was talking about last week. Darlie's bringing you more news on Thursday, and we'll be back on Friday for another Tech Test live show. But for now, thanks for watching, and goodbye.